and um, we also solve uh, business tax, tax problems as well. So today's presentation is basically for independent contractors or sales agents and how they can maximize their tax deductions. I'm going to try to keep this presentation um, within 20 to 30 minutes, uh, if not sooner. I know everyone's really busy and you, know, you guys want to make uh, those sales, so I'll try to be uh, as effective and as brief as possible. Okay, moving on. So this is the order of the presentation. I'm going to first talk about the filing requirements because the most important thing is that you make sure you file. Uh, and I'm going to emphasize why that's so important. And uh, next thing is the tax rates. And then I'm going to talk about tax calculations and the tax saving tips, basically, basically how to maximize the, those deductions. And I put a picture of uh, ben Benjamin Franklin up, and that's because uh, I just want to emphasize how important it is uh, to file those taxes. And uh, moving on, so the United States, uh, they have the system they have, and my presentation is on a federal basis uh, for federal taxes. So uh, even though uh, most states, they replicate, uh, you know, the federal regime tax system, so they're very, very similar, and the most important uh, by far is definitely in the federal system. So from a federal perspective, it's really important uh, that you file, you know, it's also important for a state perspective as well. But uh, in in the United States, we have a voluntary system. So it's up to you to file. You know, the IRS is not going to, you know, on April 15, come knocking on your door. Um, and the reason it's so important to file is you need you want to start the statute of limitations. As soon as you file, that happens. If you don't, if you never file, they can come after you 20 years later uh, down the road. Uh, rather, if you file and, you know, your taxes aren't materially misstated, they only have three years, uh, you know, to come after you. So definitely file by April 15. And the, you can get an extension for six months for filing, but that doesn't mean that's not an extension for if you owe money. So if you owe money on April 15, you still have to make a payment, even if you want to do your um, do your taxes later on. And one option is uh, you can go online and do your taxes online through like uh, you know TurboTax or you know different other companies. It's a quick way to do it. Um, and it catches most of the deductions. Uh, another option is if your taxes are a little more complicated or it's really important for you guys to maximize your deductions, you might want to get an accountant or CPA, um, especially if you have rental property or if you're self-employed like uh, most people here are as independent contractors. It's really important that uh, you really maximize your deductions so you don't pay as much taxes. And I'm going to talk about the tax the tax rates, and the reason I'm talking, you know, I'm going to show you the 2015 tax rates. It's, it's going to show you, you know, based off how much income you make, and that's after your deductions and after the adjustments and everything. You know, if you really maximize your deductions, it can make a difference between you paying 40% or possibly even 10%, uh, in, you know, in taxes. So. The way our tax system works, it's a progressive system. The more money you make, you know, the more taxes you have. So, and the tax policy behind creating this progressive system, you're going to notice for individual tax rate. For example, if you're making about $9,000, you're going to be paying 10%. But on the next slide, if you're married and you're filing jointly, if you make $18,000, you'll still be at the 10% rate. And uh, you know, the legislators, people in Congress, the reason they did this is they want basically people to get married, they want them to have kids and pay taxes and you know, purchase homes and so forth. And um, if you go to the next slide, you'll see head of household. For head of household, you'll see it's somewhere in between, uh, um, between a single person and a married filing jointly. So it's rather than 9,000 for a single person, if you make thirteen thousand, you'll be at the ten percent mark. So, the reason uh, I emphasize this, you know, these statuses, whether you're single or you know, filing uh, married, uh, it, it's really important you get the right status down. Uh, you know, I've, I've heard you know certain people always just do single, but if you're married, you, you should take advantage of that tax deduction, especially if your spouse isn't working. It's uh, it's pretty much almost like free money. Or uh, also, if you're supporting someone, 
you know, if you're you're separated, you're supporting your child, you can claim uh, head of household head of household. All right, moving on. So personal taxes, calculating your tax liability. If you look at this, if you look at the very bottom, you'll see the tax rate. That's what we just went over, right? Above tax liability in red. So our goal is to bring that taxable income down as much as possible so we get the lowest uh, tax rate. So I'm going to talk about your gross income now. And most of you uh, have probably received your 1099s by now. So that's basically your compensation. And when you do your taxes, the reason I, you know, I really emphasize going through this calculation is before I can tell you all these different deductions, it's really important to know, you know which category everything is. And for you to just have a general broad understanding, it will really help uh, whether you have an accountant, you know, you can tell them, you know, just double check, make sure they're uh, taking all these deductions and expenses. And uh, so I'm going to go through the calculation with you. So for gross income, uh, you're going to put, if you're, if you're a 1099, uh, you know, you're, you're selling insurance policies, but you, on the side, you're also, you got another 1099 gig or, you're even uh, an employee somewhere else part time. You know, you put all your gross income in there. Uh, you might get be getting a 1099 DIB or a 1099 miscellaneous. All that will go in your gross income. And as independent contractors, there's a uh, there's a Schedule C on your 1040, and that's where you're going to put uh, you know your business profit and losses. You know where your advertising expenses go. Where all your different fees that you pay for your, uh, also for your mileage and so forth. So that'll go on your Schedule C, and all this will uh, get incorporated into your gross income. So next, we're going to talk about uh, adjustments. So it's, it's really important to to emphasize. You want to get as much adjustments as you can. Some of the big ones, especially for salespeople or independent contractors, is uh, self-employment health insurance because most people probably are paying their own uh, health insurance or even for their retirement, whether they got an uh, IRA account. Uh, this is not, uh, don't get this confused with the Roth IRA because you're not going to uh, get the same deduction. If you have a traditional IRA, you know, you're going to be able to get the adjustment. And also half of self-employment FICA, so uh, you can deduct half of that. That that does not go on your uh, Schedule uh, C. This goes on your 1040, I believe, Schedule A. So that's where your adjustments go. But the most important thing to emphasize is that you're taking these deductions. You're when you're paying your uh, health insurance, when you're paying for your retirement accounts, that you're taking these deductions. If you have a student loan. And uh, you're making below seventy thousand. Uh, the interest expense on that amount, uh, you, know, you can you can take. Or if you're going to night school at night and you're doing a, uh, you're paying for tuition and fees, uh, you can deduct that. Uh, if you're paying alimony to a former spouse, you can deduct that as well. So those are some of the you know some of the important adjustments that you should be taking. And once you get the gross income. You deduct your adjustments, you get your AGI. And a lot of people, they just take the standard deduction, but it's really important that you get in the habit of uh, seeing which one is higher, whether the standard deduction is higher or the itemized deduction, because we're trying to bring that gross income down as much as possible. So if, uh, you know, if uh, your itemized deductions uh, will usually be higher if you have a mortgage, um, because the you can deduct the interest on the mortgage, or if you got a home equity line, you can uh, deduct the interest off that to a certain limit. Um, also, the taxes you pay on real estate, um, that's also deductible. Uh, also, your charitable donation, uh, your, you know, your medical expenses for you, your spouse and dependent, and so forth. So once you, uh, once you calculate, calculate uh, the total amount of your itemized deduction, and if you're married, uh, and you're filing jointly. If your total itemized deduction is not above twelve thousand six hundred, then you'll take your standard deduction. And it really depends on your filing status. If you're single, your standard deduction is pretty low, six thousand three hundred. 
you know, so your itemized deduction, if you're single, if you really keep track of your receipts and your expenses, should exceed your standard uh, deduction. So once you get the AGI income and you take your deductions, uh, you want to go next to the personal exemptions. And this year, they, uh, in 2015, they increased the personal exemption amount by 4000 Usually this amount increases by inflation. And the, ca the calculation for personal exemption is very simple. You just take 4000 then you multiply it, uh, multiply it by the number of exemptions. Uh, you would be exempting yourself, uh, you know, if no one's claiming you on their taxes, and you know, as independent contractors, I don't, I don't think anyone is uh, claiming you uh, as an exemption because you're probably making money and uh, you're supporting yourself. Also, if you have a spouse, uh, you know, that doesn't work, and you know, she's, uh, you can take her as well. Or if, even if she works, you know, uh, if you're filing jointly, you can use her as an exemption. Also, for uh, your, if you have children, uh, you, each one uh, of your children will be uh, counted as an exemption. So, for for example, if, if it's you and your wife and you have two kids, that's four exemptions. So you take four thousand and you multiply it by four. That's sixteen thousand that you can take. Uh, to reduce your uh, gross income your or your AGI amount. And one um, one exemption that I see a lot of people that they don't take advantage of uh, is if you have an elderly parent that you take care of, even, and everyone thinks that they have, to, you know, that person has to live with you, but for a grandparent, they don't necessarily have to live with you. As long as they're not really making money, they could be possibly collecting Social Security, as long as they don't go above a certain amount of money. For that grandparent, uh, and you're you know you're supporting them, then you can uh, add another exemption, and that would be five exceptions with the example I just stated before. So that would be twenty thousand rather than sixteen thousand that you would have as a personal exemption. So after your personal exemptions, what you'll get is your taxable income. So that taxable income, hopefully, we got it low enough that will be in one of the lower tax brackets, either the 10 or probably not the 10, probably in the more in the 15% if we really take advantage of it, uh, you know, all the deductions. Uh, but if you made a lot of money, it's, uh, you know, which is a good thing, it's kind of harder to get in the 15%. You just don't want to get in like the 40% or like, you know, the, the higher tax brackets. So then you take the tax rate, multiply it by your taxable income, that's your tax, uh, tax liability. And now I'm going to talk about kind of, I'm going to talk about uh, the tax saving tips, and this is probably um, you know the area that's probably pretty juicy for most of you guys. And, um, and I really emphasize on uh, when I work with independent contractors and when I'm looking at uh, their businesses, what um, what deductions. Uh, that they're not taking advantage of, and where the, uh, where they can uh, save a lot of money. So these are four categories where I see there's a lot of opportunity where you can reduce your gross income and uh, bring down that uh, taxable income. So the first one is advertising. And almost any type of business-related advertising uh, is, uh, is deductible. There's, some, there's, few, there's a few exceptions. I'll go into that uh, a little later. Also, the business travel and entertainment you know, I'll, I'll talk about that as well. The home office expense, that's a huge one. Um, a lot of people don't take it, take advantage of that. And a lot of people do have uh, home offices and they don't even realize. And you can take a portion of your rent that you're paying actually uh, your, at your, you know, your home or your apartment and you can actually deduct that from your taxes. And uh, the next is health insurance premium. I'm not going to talk about health insurance premiums. I'm not going to emphasize on that. Too much because it's kind of self-explanatory that you can deduct, uh, you know, the premiums that you pay for your medical, dental, and uh, your other insurance coverage for you, your spouse, and your dependents. All right. Next, I'm going to talk about. I'm going to emphasize uh, advertising. So, what advertising expenses are deductible? And you know. 
that when you really just think about it just from a common sense perspective, this is just things that you spend money on to solicit uh, your business. And as an independent contractor, you know that you're considered a separate business and so you're, you need to promote your product, you know, you need to promote your insurance plans um, in order to make money or to make money more effectively. So the things you spend on business, uh, the money you spend on business cards or uh, if you advertise um, in the newspaper, you make billboards, all that is considered advertising. The one thing that's not considered advertising is uh, if you're trying to influence uh, like decision makers, legislation, the Congress. And an example would be, and I don't think anyone is doing this, but let's say you uh, create an ad on the radio, on the TV, and you're just bashing Obamacare because you don't make that much money on Obamacare and you're trying to get Congress to, or you're trying to get you know the Re Republican Party to uh, knock down um, you know, Obamacare. That would be considered uh, you trying to influence uh, the government decision makers. Uh, and that would not be considered, uh, you could not do that bad advertising. So that, that's one of the exceptions for advertising. All right, so I have a little question. Uh, don't look at the very bottom, and this is the bottom has an answer, but here's a question that I have to emphasize the point of advertising expenses. So my example is, so Terry is in a, an insurance salesperson. He pays $1,000 for a booth at a health insurance uh, trade fair and $500 for signs and a display rack to showcase his insurance plan. Can Terry do that this amount? So take about 20 seconds just to think about this. And afterwards, I'll explain the answer. Okay, so if, let's just think about this, not even look at the answer yet. Like, what's Terry doing? You know, he, he's going to this trade fair. He's not going with his buddies. He's not going to hang out. Um, it's not a hobby for him to go to insurance trade fairs, you know. He's an insurance salesperson. He's going there because he wants to promote his product, you know. So what Terry is doing is, you know, he's going to this trade fair to advertise and hopefully make some sales or uh, you know, later on meet some people that will lead to sales. Um, so Terry can deduct the table fees or you know, the other small business expenses incurred to promote his, uh, his insurance business. So when you're promoting your business, you know, whether it's at a trade, trade fair or whether you're uh, sending out flyers or so forth, you can, you can deduct that amount. And the, the whole amount can be deducted, not just the thousand dollars. Also, the what he pays for the signs and, and the, the, the display rack. All right. Next, I'm going to talk about how to maximize business travel deduction. From my understanding, or you know, the way the business model works for um, for salespeople, they travel a lot. You know, they're going from point A to point B. You know, and when when you're traveling so much, um, all you know the amount that you're traveling for business purposes, that amount is deductible. So if you have your own vehicle and you're traveling, the amount you spend on uh, you know for gas, oil, maintenance, repairs, all that uh, is potentially de deductible. And the IRS gives you. Uh, two methods to do it, and you can do the higher of the two. You can do, you know, the actual cost, the amount you spend for gas, oil, and, and so forth, or what I call is kind of the, the lazy method, and that's kind of a misnomer. It's not really the, the lazy method. If you have a really cheap car, if you have like a fifteen hundred dollar car or two thousand dollar car, uh, and the car doesn't give you, you know, that much problems, you might want to take the standard deduction, which means just keep track of the mileage you're you're driving for business purposes. And just multiply uh, multiply by 57. It's 0.5, not 0.6. It's a little typo. I know it's not much of a difference, but I just thought I would emphasize that. Um, so when I was at the IRS, uh, 
I know this is, uh, in tax court there was there was a case we had, and uh, this real estate agent was trying to argue that you know she was keeping track of her mileage to sell these homes. And what she was doing was uh, she was writing her mileage on these little sticky pads, and she bought her sticky pads to court. And the judge wasn't buying that. And uh, so if, if there's one thing about, you know, driving, uh, you know, for business purposes, but it's really important that you document uh, your mileage in a way that will be accepted. Because you can report the amount, but it's not just about reporting the amount on your taxes. It's about having uh, a defensible claim just in case if the IRS comes after you. And you should really get in the habit. And the way you can do this, um, if you're doing the actual cost of gas, oil, and maintenance, you know, let's say you're going to one of uh, your sales clients, you know, and you go to the gas station, you fill up your tank. On the back of the receipt, uh, you can write the name of the client, write the purpose that you're going there, you know, for sale, insurance sales, you know. And just make sure the receipt has a date and has a total amount. Uh, that should be suffice. If you're doing the act, if you're doing the standard uh, mileage, the 57.5 cents. In my opinion, the best way to do this is just everyone probably has access to you know Google Maps. It's free, or MapQuest. Just print out a Google Maps from uh, your principal place of business, whether you know that's the office or if you're using your uh, your personal residence, say your personal place of business. So from from that location to the client site, do a map quest and see how many miles it is. If uh, and then write on that piece of paper when you print it out the name of the client, uh, you know, the date that you're going, and uh, the total mileage multiply it by uh, the 57.5, and there we go. You got your deduction, and that will be upheld in court as well. All right, next. Oh, there's a little diagram right here. So a lot of people wonder, like, what is uh, what is deductible? And if you look at the diagram right here, if you have your official residence, okay? Let's say you don't do anything. You don't have a home office. If you don't have a home office and where, where you have to go to a different location where that's the official station uh, to do your administrative work, to do your whatever, that's where your decision making is done at the official station. The mileage from your official residence to the official station will not be deductible. Uh, however, when if from the official station, if you go to a client site, uh, you go to a client's home to sell some insurance policies, the mileage from there will be deductible. And a really good tax planning uh, tip is if you can make your residence a place where you're doing, uh, you know, you're doing your administrative work, you're taking phone calls from clients, you're you're doing a lot of things, and if occasionally you have to go to the, you know, to a, another office, you know, and that's not your your principal place of office. You can deduct all the mileage from, uh, you know, going to the client site to going to another office that's not your principal place of office and so forth. All right, moving on. Next is business, meals, and entertainment. And you can deduct 50% uh, of this. So if you're taking a client out to lunch or if you're taking the clients out to an Angels game or a baseball game, um, you can deduct this. And something I want to emphasize is if you're taking someone to a baseball game and you go up to a scalper and you pay five times what the face value of the ticket is, you can't take that the value that you pay to the to the scalper. You have to take the value of what the face value of the tickets are. So that's something I wanted to emphasize. And you know, lunches with uh, with clients, you take them out for lunch or something. Fifty percent of that's deductible as well. And you know the amount that you pay for the tax and tip that's the uh, you can include that as well. And again, I, I really emphasize on documenting your expenses because you can report, you can document a lot of deductions, but the t the key is that you're taking deductions that if you get audited, it'll be upheld, so you won't have any problems, and you won't have to see an attorney like me, all right. 
So uh, the way I document the expenses is by uh, if I take a client out to, to lunch, uh, I just put the name of the clients that are with me at lunch on the back of the receipt, and I put the purpose of uh, you know the lunch, you know, and I make sure I talk about taxes or whatever during that lunch. Uh, I don't have to talk about taxes the whole time, you know. I just have to, you know, I have to talk about it a little bit while we're having lunch. And uh, I circled the date and the total amount, and there's my documentation. All right, moving on. All right, now here's the home office deduction that I kept on uh, talking about and stating how much, uh, you know, how good of a tax saving tip this is. So if you use your home office, uh, if you use your home as your office as well, you can potentially deduct a portion of that. And there's a simplified option and there's the regular method. And you know, the simplified option, I, I kind of think it's like the lazy method if you don't want to you know, really calculate everything. Uh, the IRS lets you do uh, $5 per square feet for up to 300 square feet. So the max you can get per year is 1500 But before we even talk about how much you can get, you can't just use your wife's like powder room and say that's my uh, you know that's my home office. It's got to be actually a place where you exclusively and you, you use on a regular basis as your home office. And I gave a pretty good uh, somewhat legal explanation of what this exclusive use is at the bottom of this slide and what a regular use and business use is, is as well. So uh, what's really uh, what's really awesome about this, uh, this deduction is if you take the re regular method, you can deduct the actual expenses you spend uh, on your home office, whether it's the rent, the utilities, you know, the internet, so forth. And I'm going to give an example to kind of explain this with the regular method and show you what the difference between the simpl simplified and the regular method is. So here's an example. Again, don't don't look at the bottom. Uh, let's Let's try to figure this out before we look at the answer. All right, so Terry uses a one bedroom of his two bedroom apartment as his principal office of his sales business. The home office is 200 square feet. The total square footage of his uh, two bedroom apartment is 800 square feet. His monthly rent, which includes utilities, uh, let's say utilities, internet, uh, you know, the whole. Uh, water, gas, all that, is $2,000 a month. So let, let's think about this. All right, so he's got, he's got a two-bedroom apartment, and he's using one of the bedrooms, so he's using 200 out of 800 square feet. If we use the, the simplified method, we know he can't do, he has to do 200 square feet times the five, uh, $5 per square feet. So that's a thousand dollars maximum he could deduct for the year. However, if he uses the regular method, uh, so 200 uh, divided by 800, that's 25 percent. 25 percent of two thousand dollars is five hundred dollars a month he can deduct. Five hundred dollars per month times 12, that's six thousand dollars he can deduct versus one thousand if he uses the simplified method. So that's a that's a huge saving. All right, and that's the end of my uh, that's the end of my presentation. And now I've reserved ten minutes for Q and A. If you guys uh, have any questions regarding the presentation, and all right. Thank you, Ahmed, for that. Um, guys, there's a chat option at the top of your screen. You can go ahead and enter any questions. Also, if you haven't already done so, you can either change your the name of your viewer so that I know who's on the on this call. Or you can go ahead and type in your name in the chat option. That way we can keep a, a, a log of, of who's attending the training. You can also use that chat box, like I said, for any questions that you may have. We'll give it a few minutes for some questions to come in. Omid, thank you very much for the, for the, the training that you gave us this morning. I know it's a pretty complicated subject. Oh, no problems. Thank you for having me. And if you guys have uh, any questions, I've provided my email address. 
and uh, you know something's really pressing, uh, you can give me a call. Uh, I do a you know first twenty minute free consultation. So. Okay, thank you for that, Omid. Yeah. Okay, Deborah, thank you very much for putting in your name. Guys, any questions? Okay, so Cynthia, thank you for your question. So her question is, rather than keeping track of mileage for visits, I was advised that I could do an oil change in, in January and December and go based on that. Omid? Yeah, you can, you can do the the oil change, but if you do the oil change, uh, that's only one, like uh, one part or one aspect of that deduction. You can also do your gas. Uh, you know, you can also do uh, the maintenance. You know, if you're you're doing brakes and so forth. But the tricky part is you can't. Uh, you got to apportion it, and you got to monitor what portion you're using. If you're using that car just for business purposes, you can take the whole amount. But if you're not using that car. Uh, you're using it for personal and business, you have to monitor uh, and apportion which, uh, what percentage you're using for personal and what percentage you're using for, um, for business to, to take that uh, oil change amount. And you shouldn't just do the oil change. Yeah, keep track of your oil changes, your gases, everything you spend on that car. Okay, Omid. So she has a little twist to the thing. Um, I guess she only uses her car for business. So she put that they told her that if she gets the oil change in January and one in December, that it'll show the mileage um, as far as reporting the mileage. Yeah, that's that's a way you can substantiate it. Um, and if she's only using the car for business purposes, uh, that's a way you can do it. Uh, the IRS, uh, they actually use this term called guesstimation. It means you don't have to have these precise amounts. If you, you can substantiate it. Uh, to a certain extent, then that's enough evidence for them. And but they, they're not going to. If you take little sticky pads and put the mileage on there, that's not really good. To, uh, good good evidence to substantiate it. But if an independent third party, like a uh, oil change mechanic shop, is putting your address at the end of, at the beginning and at the end of the year, you know that's pretty reliable if based off you know my view. Okay, and Deborah has another question. Um, if you um, can you use a Schedule C for? Do you have to use a Schedule C for every business you have? Uh, no, you don't have to. Um, if I don't know if you guys uh, are incorporated, like if you're an LLC or um, you know how you're, you guys are structured. But if you're like a single member LLC, uh, you can use. Uh, you can use the Schedule C, but you know independent contractors should be using a Schedule C because they are, uh, you know, you don't have to, but you're a small business, and the Schedule C really has all the right categories as far as like it has your a category for your advertising expenses. It has a category for, uh, you know, your car and truck expenses, your uh, your commission and fees. And, you know everything. It's more accurately labeled than uh, than the 1040. Uh, you know, just the regular 1040. And if you have more than one small business, do you need to do a separate tax uh, um, filing or report for each individual business, or can it go on the same one? No, uh, you can have. Um, it could it could all go on the same uh, same 1040. You can have like uh, you know different schedules. Uh, Different schedule C's. Uh, if you have multiple multiple businesses, uh, I'm assuming uh, you know if you're a 1099, you have you have you know various different entities. Uh, you can definitely uh, you can e you can either consolidate it and put the total amounts in, and uh, or you can create separate uh, schedule C's. Okay. All right. So. Um... Thank you, Deborah, for the question. Anybody else? Um, now we have a question: Is it more beneficial to lease a car and deduct that payment versus mileage? Uh, there, the rules are a lot more stringent when uh, you lease it, uh, but it, it really depends on you. Um, you know, you got to calculate what the lease payment is per month, 
and uh, or if if you have a car that you're already using, uh, you know sometimes the lease payments it m might not make sense to pay like you know twenty thirty thousand dollars or you know three four hundred dollars a month. Uh, so it, it really depends on the facts and circumstances. But if you can lease it, you can deduct the the whole lease amount uh, if you're using that car for just for uh, business purposes. So there's potentially more tax savings. But just because you're having more tax savings, you really want to uh, spend your money on areas where you're going to see a return on your income. Um, so if you can get away with uh, using a cheaper car or using your, the car yet that you have already, then um, and rather than incurring that $400 or $300 a month uh, for a lease, you, know, you might as well do that. Okay, thank you very much. Anybody else? Any more questions? Any more questions? Okay, guys. So um, you have OMED's contact information. You have OMED's contact information on the screen there. Feel free to reach out for him for any questions. And then um, you can also shoot me an email with any questions that you may have, and I'll go ahead and forward it over to him. If you haven't already done so, can you please um, this, I'm going to go ahead and end this webinar now. Can you please send me a quick email with your name letting me know that you participated in this webinar so that we can keep accurate count of who's participating. Um, the bigger participation we get, the more we can, uh, the more training we can have for this. All right, thank you guys, and everybody enjoy your day. All right, thank you.